He kōna e pūrangi tēnei nā te reo irirangi o Aotearoa. They say life is stranger than fiction. The entanglement process in of itself was something that Einstein actually brought up. Einstein was very uncomfortable with quantum mechanics. It has a very statistical mm. nature. This was one of those things that made him quite uncomfortable. But sometimes what we see in movies or read in books is so incredible that it obviously couldn't be possible. Or could it? You have to be tiny for one photon to move the thing because it doesn't carry a whole lot individually of this momentum. But, uh, but if you have a C, a huge number of photons hitting something, you will have photonic pressure. Welcome to Sci-Fi Sci-Fact with me, Brian Crump. Every week a scientist from New Zealand's McDiamond Institute explains the facts behind the fiction. In this episode, Dr. Christa Steenbergen, physics lecturer in the School of Chemical and Physical Sciences at Victoria University of Wellington and McDiamond Institute associate investigator, gives us her take on Philoat, the quantum entangled method of faster than light communication from Ender's Game. We need minds like yours, Ender. Young people integrate complex data more easily than adults. If there's a chance that because of you, the Formics might leave us alone forever, then I have to ask you to come with me. It's what I was born for, right? Philoat. Or is it Philoat? We haven't really decided how we're going to pronounce this. I think have I'd, we, Krista? I probably go with Philoat. That's how I've been saying it in my head since I read the book. What book? So the Ender's Game series. I have read speak, uh, Ender's Game and Speaker for the Dead, which would be the first two books, at least chronologically, written uh, for the series. And then there's this whole other series that I have not delved into. And from doing a little research for this session, it turns out Philoat features quite heavily in the later books as well. But, um, but it shows up uh, in Speaker for the Dead, which is the second book that was written by Orson Scott Card. Now, Philoat, let's, let's, let's go on Philoat, because yeah. I, I just imagine that's how Harrison Ford would say it. I think that's and probably he was correct. A, so. he, he was in the movie version. Yes, yes. Right. He was the commander of Ender in the movie version of, the, of Ender's Game, just Ender's Game. Well, so. Tell us a bit more about Ender's Game. It is the Ender's Game is a book about a young person who is selected to go to a star academy. I think there are some very strong parallels between uh, the United States version of at least what I know um, of the Air Force Academy and the Naval Academy types of things, probably Air Force Academy. But in this version, the Star Academy that he goes to is in space. And I probably will stop there because I don't want to give away any of the extra pieces of the book because there's a nice... There's a nice twist at the end that, at least when I read it for the first time, was quite unexpected. So, But in general, it involves alien wars. Ah, there are alien wars. Uh, in, these, in this book, yeah. yes. So, so that's what we've been trying to find. Not other humans, but aliens. But aliens, right. very much so. Right. Yep. By the way, that wasn't an alien war sound we just heard there. That was Krista <laughs> just brushing the, the pop the pop shield but that made a really resonant can you do that again actually yeah sure i'll try that's Is that's that really it? impressive you ah. could almost make that a sound effect for something you know <laughs> almost like a gong now what i was about to say ah. Uh, Philoat, yes. in terms of Ender's Game, is is a plot driver. What does Philoat do? Uh, well, actually, it doesn't. It doesn't show up so much in Ender's Game, but it definitely shows up in Speaker for the Dead. In theory, I think from what I was reading, Philoat is is some particle or a set of particles that travel faster than the speed of light, and it is the reason it ends up featuring in Speaker for the Dead is because it is a part of this thing called the Ansible. Uh, that shows up in Speaker for the Dead. It might show up in Ender's Game as well, but I don't remember it as much. But the Ansible allows uh, communication, instantaneous communication over vast universe distances. Ah. So in- you see, that's one of the things that science fiction movies, and I was just watching um, one of the Star Wars movies last night. Oh. I think it was Rogue One with my son. And there they are, traveling through through hyperspace, 
and they can still talk yeah. instantly with anybody, it seems, anywhere, you know? As if you're and on I the think, telephone, you know? Yeah. yeah. You know, hello, it's it's a bad... No, it's not even a bad line. Yeah. It's a, they get a better line than we do the sedan. Exactly. You know, exactly. except actually the last line we got the sedan was really, really good. But, yeah, I always <laughs> think, you know, that is kind of struggling with the law of physics, isn't it? I mean, they're maybe light years away, and they are heading away or towards something at, at lo- over light speed, and yet... This communication is instant. Breaking the laws of physics. Yeah, yes. yeah. yeah. So this is actually one way around it. Here's a particle, a subatomic particle, yep. that can travel faster than the speed of light. Yep. So you can think about it like your telephone line that goes you know, from here to God only knows where, but this one goes through intergalactic yeah. distances. Move so. over 5G, here's 1500G. Exactly. You know, 15 million G. Yeah. In the universe that we know of, that we inhabit, there is nothing that we're aware of that can travel faster than the speed of light. Can you tell us why? It seems to be a fundamental speed limit. It seems to be, from our observations at this point in time, it seems to be the universal, quite literally uh, universal speed limit. And many, many theories exist or are based on that speed limit. Mm. So Einstein's theory of special relativity, he, he wrote that paper in 1905. It has to do with how time time and space both change when you go very at very fast speeds. And uh, we've now, with the time that he created theory, people actually didn't believe him because it seemed very science fiction. Mm. It did, um, didn't it? Yeah, very One much so. One could travel at the speed of light and you could travel at the speed of light for the rest of your life and you wouldn't age. You wouldn't age, precisely. So uh, the reality of it is that uh, something with mass kept by, by his theories cannot travel at the speed of light because it would require infinite energy. So in the Large Hadron Collider, they are, they are buzzing things around at 99% of the speed of light or something like that. If it has rest mass, it will be point, they can get things up to 0.99999, very, very close to the speed of light. But, but they can't, not 100%. Not 100%. Because that we do not, that would take all the energy yes. in, in the cosmos. Energy, yes. We don't have it. More more energy than, than at least what we know of in the cosmos. So, so how yeah. come photons can travel at the speed of light? Uh, they have no rest mass. So they have only energy. They are pure energy. So the absence of rest mass allows them to travel at the speed of light. And so it's that it's that absence of the rest mass that allows the travel at the speed of light. But it's a, it's a, it's a really interesting conundrum, or not conundrum, a uh, fact that the photons actually carry a lot of the th- same things that we associate with mass. It's just mm. that rest mass, I should say. It's just that they don't carry rest mass. Can't photons move other, when yes. light hits other things? Yes. It can move them. Move there's, it. There's a, so a, despite having no mass, mm-hmm. they can move. The, the, oh, can't I, am I yes. remembering experiments at, at school where things in a vacuum would move something? Absolutely. So actually, uh, many, many experiments uh, where photons carry what we call momentum. So momentum is if you have two cars that hit one another, um, you know, one, if they have equal, ma- equal mass and they're traveling with equal velocities, the momentum of those two objects will be the same. It's a mass and velocity thing, and then they hit, and then they will be at rest, right? Um, if one of them is at rest and the car hits, like, the car at rest, the other car will move, and that's what photons will do. So photons, if you have to be tiny for one photon to move the thing because it doesn't carry a whole lot individually of this momentum, but, uh, but if you have a C, a huge number of photons hitting something, you will have photonic pressure. And the photons, say, coming from the light on this studio, there'd be millions, billions of them? Yes. Right. Uh, uh, uncountable. So, yep, most definitely. And they will carry some pressure, some, some, some momentum with them. Uh, and so when it hits us... Uh, most of the time, you know, we think of uh, heat due to sunlight, and that's a different phenomenon than the actual momentum. But there is momentum also in the photons coming from the sun, most definitely. So, what we try to do, like to do, in this series is tease out some facts that might be there in the fiction. And on one level, phyloots are great because they set up a possibility, a universe where we can communicate with somebody light years away yep. straight away pick up the phone hello yep you know light from alpha centauri takes four years yep 
So at the moment, the best we could do would be a conversation where you say hello, and eight years later, they their hello comes back. <laughs> That's a long time on hold, you know. Not very satisfying. That's worse than your. That's much worse than your average call centre. <laughs> <laughs> Heaven true. help us if they ever outsourced <laughs> stuff to Alpha Centauri. Yes, most um, definitely. But uh, that's one thing. However, nothing, as far as we know, that has mass can travel faster than the speed of light. Not, in fact, nothing can travel faster than the photon, which doesn't have rest mass. So. Right. How can we expect anything? Is there anything in real life that might one day equate to what uh, phylotes do? So I'll bring up two things. Uh, one of them, it, one of them is a misunderstood thing, and it does not allow faster than faster than the speed of light communication. And then the other thing is the phenomenon that could exist that, in my opinion, could allow faster than the speed of light at least. It's not faster than the speed of light, but it could allow communication over this um, four light year period that you're talking about. So the first thing that is commonly misunderstood is this thing called quantum entanglement. We, we live in a bizarre and wonderful universe. Mm. And both this special and general activity that I'm talking about change our view of this wonderful universe that we live in. But the other side of it is, and that's a big scale, that's big gravitational or also very fast speeds. But then quantum is when you get down to the very tiny, right? And in the quantum world, many of our notions of how things work get flipped on their head. So this phenomenon of quantum entanglement is the fact that we can create states of matter, let's call them states of matter, that are entangled with one another. And so there might be two particles and then we can entangle those two particles in certain ways for some of their properties. And then what can happens with quantum entanglement is that we can then separate those particles over very long distances. And if we now measure the property of one, let's say here in New Zealand, and we've moved the entangled particle to Germany, the minute we measure the properties of this particle here in New Zealand, we know greater than statistical amount that we should know about what's going to be measured in Germany. So okay. something we do to a subatomic particle in New Zealand instantaneously. Yes. Not at the speed of light, faster than the speed of light. Thousands instantaneously. And thousands of times faster right. than the speed of light instantaneously. Affects something, another particle, which we've entangled and then we've separated. Very much so. That sounds like a phylo to me. <laughs> <laughs> What's the catch? The catch is that every experiment that we've done to date has proven that you cannot use these entangled states to transfer information. So the entanglement process in of itself was something that Einstein actually brought up as a reason. Einstein was very uncomfortable with quantum mechanics. Mm. He didn't like it. has a very didn't, statistical nature. He said something about God not playing dice. Very much so. And so this was one of those things that made him quite uncomfortable because he believed fundamentally in the speed limit of the universe being the speed of light. And he realized, even before we could do measurements or create these entangled par particles in a lab, that uh, this could happen. This could be a, something that could happen out of quantum, me quantum mechanics. And he really didn't like it. And he called it actually spooky action at a distance. <laughs> So, yes, it's, it's an actual quote, Einstein, Einsteinian quote, spooky action at a distance. I just love the sound of Einstein with his voice talking about spooky action in the yes, distance. Yes, exactly. So, and, and this was one of his arguments against quantum mechanics. But I think the end of this whole thing is that these particles still do not break the speed limit because we cannot use it to transmit any kind of information. So no information can travel between these two particles. We don't understand why, if we measure one at one end, it automatically affects the measurement that we would be making at the other end. This could be light years apart, okay? We're not capable of measuring one in such a way that, couldn't you do something, kind of, a kind of a Morse code? Well, this a is- A binary sort of signal that, it's happening instantaneously. This is precisely the problem. You've, you've nailed it. Perfect. So the minute we do something that affects this particle, changes its state in some way. Like, let's say you usually use up and down mm. as the states of these particles. So let's say that we have the state and we measure it as a up. 
uh, we, we at that moment will know that the particle on the other end, usually it's down. Uh, it's usually entangled in the up-down state. Um, but the minute we try to flip that particle to a, from up to down here locally, we break the entanglement. So the, the minute we try to change the state of the particle that we have in our lab here in New Zealand, we will break the entanglement. But we could do it for journey. one message, couldn't we? One signal, and then we could have another particle entangled pair for the next signal? It's actually, it's much more along the lines of the fact that we don't know when we create the entangled state whether ours will be up or down. It's only when we make the measurement that we can figure out, okay, right. ours is up, therefore theirs must be down. And so even for that one measurement, even for that one drop of a Morse code, one bit, I don't know how actually you would say it, one, 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 one bit of a Morse code, we can't transmit the message because mm. we don't know what will be made. We don't know what we will measure and we don't know what they will measure. Right. Would we even be aware of a change? So See, we know is, something's changed, but we wouldn't be aware that it's changed. It's, so this is the movement we have to be careful about, and that's where the spooky action at a distance, I think, gets misinterpreted. So it's the fact that this particle that we have here, it's, um, we can't do anything to it. We can, oh, well, we can measure it. That's the thing we can do. If we were to try to flip its spin, uh, flip it from an up to a down state, or do anything to it in that way, we break the entanglement. Right. And so, so when we talk about um, that, that would we know anything that had happened without communication in Germany, they wouldn't know that we've mm. measured here in New Zealand. And the only way to communicate is at the speed of speed light. Speed of light, exactly. Which so gets you us, hit the nail on the head. Yeah. Yep. yep. Okay. Um, there are there are two ways I could take this conversation. I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna ask both questions. All right. Uh, first off, how is it? Do we have any understanding as to how this entanglement happens in the first place? How you can have the seeming relationship between two subatomic particles, and it doesn't matter how far away they are, it's instantaneous. That seems to defy the law of physics, doesn't it? The, the quantum entanglement blows my mind every single time I look into it. It is an amazing thing. And yes, to me, I won't say that it defies the laws of physics, but I do have to sort of take it as it is. Um, it's, the understanding is in the mathematics. And it's some beautiful mathematics that explain it. What I'll, or actually, I need to be careful. Don't explain it. Um, it's some beautiful mathematics that can describe this phenomenon. I think that's what I should say. I had this. I asked a. I asked a, a colleague who studies uh, quantum physics at a much deeper level than I do, the exact same question you just asked, and his response to me was, "Well, we're getting into philosophy now." Yeah. And so, <laughs> so it made me giggle oh, a little yeah. bit. Oh, yeah. So, um, Next but, thing you'll be saying, we're getting into religion now. Exactly. Mm. And then we really need to tread carefully. <laughs> um, no, it's, it's a really interesting thing because the, um, we, can, we, we can create these experiments very repeatedly. We know how to entangle the particles. But once you start striking up on the why... Uh, actually, the why in quantum physics is very, very commonly just pushed into the mathematics. Mm, okay. And so, yeah, it's a very, very challenging question. Right. In very intriguing one. But, so uh, quantum yeah. entanglement is not not the phylotes we're looking for, but then, but you said there was another thing that might be. So what is that? Well, I think I think for me, this thing called a wormhole probably looks much more like this ansible that we talked about at the very beginning of uh, our discussion, where um, the Ansible is supposedly created of phylotes that, that allows this um, telephone line to go across, mm -hmm. you know, intergalactic distances, right? And so, uh, the, the, and, and so it's not so much the phylote itself, the particle itself, but it's maybe more of a way of communicating across vast distances, far, far, much further than we currently think we can, right? And so um, the wormhole essentially comes out of one of the possible solutions of Einstein's field equations. So this is actually not his special theory of relativity, but uh, the general theory of relativity that deals with gravitation. And what energy and mass do to space-time, because we live in this space-time universe, is it, it bends it. And so if you consider, if you think about a sheet of paper, I think this is Kip Thorne is a, a professor at Caltech, and he's sort of the, the 
world's foremost expert on these things, so I need to be very careful. I, I'm sure I'm not doing it justice. But if you think about the space-time normally without mass or energy exists as a sheet of paper, and then if you have a, a big bit of mass, you can actually bend that piece of paper quite a bit with that mass. And if you bend it, you put more mass in, you create more gravity, you bend it more, you can actually think about the piece of paper sort of folding in almost over on itself. And one of the solutions to Einstein's field equations, which describe this bending, is that there could exist a tunnel between those two ends of the paper. Okay? And that tunnel could connect something that exists on one side of the sheet of paper to the other side of the sheet of paper, that if you went along the paper, you would be traveling 5 billion light years. But if you go through the sheet of paper, through the through the sheet of paper as it's bended, you're talking about a distance of could be mere meters, depending on how severe this bend is. And so now you talk about instead of making a phone call where the, the information that I'm giving has to travel all the way around the billions of light years that exist on that sheet of paper, what if you can send the information through the wormhole, through this sort of odd bit of space where it just goes straight through the paper, so are, over meters. Are black holes the openings to wormholes? So now we are actually very much beyond my expertise. Mm -hmm. So in in general, the wormholes, the, the thing that I can say is that they come out of very certain solutions to these field equations that we discussed. Um, what I will say is that I'm not an expert in what would be differential geometry or general theory of relativity enough to discuss what creates the wormholes. Um, but, uh, but I believe that black holes are involved in certainly supermassive things, and black holes are supermassive uh, objects that create massive gravitational pull. Wouldn't you need something that's going to create a huge amount of mass yes. for you to bend space-time? To that extent. So you're going to have to be able to manipulate this, exactly. this very massive thing exactly, uh, to bend space. Yes. And who knows where it's going to come out? It, well, that's precisely it. Who, who knows where it's going to come out and who knows? Uh, and, and I have to, have to say, one of the interesting things about these wormholes is we started by discussing this thing called space-time. So these wormholes exist not only in a spatial sense, but in a time sense. So not only where will they come out, but when mm. will they come out? Mm. And when it comes to time travel, and we've talked about time <laughs> travel with other guests in this series, the question I ask is, well, if we are able to travel back in time, uh, why haven't people arrived from the future yet? So this is actually Kip Thorne, this gentleman that I spoke about. Um, if you stick purely with the, uh, the, the, the equations that we know at this point, which have been proven over and over again, so this is Einstein's field equations that come out of general relativity, um, the, there's a limit on how far back you could go if you were able to manipulate or create time travel machines. And that limit is when you created the machine. So if, uh, Kip Thorne has said that if his grandson creates the machine today, um, his grandson would need to worry about his future children coming back and killing him, but that Kip Thorne does not need to worry about that happening because the time travel machine has not been invented, because the, the maximum you can travel back evidently is when the time travel machine was created. Ah, once we create time travel machines, all bets are off. Exactly. That'll be we, the end of Lotto. We, exactly. Precisely. We, we might need to worry about this infiltration of future selves that uh, come flooding back to, to greet us. But since we haven't done it yet, we have that nice limit. So, yeah. Thanks for listening to this episode of Sci-Fi Sci-Fact, hosted by me, Brian Crump, produced by Andrew Robertson, and of course, made possible thanks to the incredible knowledge of those brilliant scientists at the McDiarmid Institute. You can find more episodes of Sci-Fi Sci-Fact on the RNZ Podcasts page. RNZ Podcasts are also available on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, iHeartRadio, or pretty much wherever you might find your podcasts. And make sure to follow us so you don't miss out on any new episodes. <laughs>